not only did he have a relationship with the government, but he had a mole in the FBI. In this world, you look out for number one. If you, if any people, take that oath to the grave. These guys are on the streets, so they're involved in, in hustling. All right, welcome back into the OG podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein, a true crime journalist, author, uh, historian, organized crime expert, etc. I'm with my partner, uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. I uh, am the author of Early Organized Crime in Detroit. I research and write about organized crime. I was a faculty member at the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northern Arizona University. And I'm happy to be here co-hosting the podcast. Uh, I want to give uh, recognition to our producer, Signore Roberto Boshane, hey on now. the mix. Hey <laughs> now. Hey uh, now. <laughs> anyhow, we are happy uh, and um, fortunate to have a great guest today, Larry Meza. He was a captain in the Colombo crime family. The Colombo crime family is one of the five families in New York. Some of the most colorful and violent Gangsters in the history of New York organized crime emerged from the Colombo family. Characters like Joe Colombo, Crazy Joe Gallo, uh, Greg the Grim Reaper, Scarpa, Carmine the Snake, Persico. So a very colorful history. Uh, Larry Meza was a member of the family. He came up under the tutelage of Greg Scarpa. So he's going to talk about that experience. Greg Scarpa, not only a notoriously violent criminal, but uh, behind the scenes, an informant for the FBI. So a very interesting story here. And then during the 1990s, a civil war erupted within the Colombo crime family. And uh, there were shootings, gangland shootings on the streets of New York. A number of in individuals were killed. And Larry was part of this. So uh, we're really happy to have him talk about his experiences in the New York Mafia on the OG podcast. All right, so Larry, um, there there was a lot of uh, news out of the uh, the mob uh, gangland landscape in uh, New York over the last couple of weeks. We had a uh, what looked like possibly the start of a mob war, but it turns out it was considerably less benign than that. Um, with the with the murder of Gambino street boss underboss uh, uh, Frankie Boy Cali, um, it looks like now that it was just a, a kind of a mentally deranged, lovesick. Uh, young man from Staten Island that, that did it. I've kind of been analogizing it maybe kind of to the, the John Lennon assassination of, of, of the mob world. But uh, kind of talk about when you, when you first heard about uh, Frankie Boy Cali's murder. Well, I saw it online, the murder of Frankie Boy, uh, and I got a chuckle out of everybody trying to figure out how it was done, who did it. Of course, Gene's name came up. I doubted that myself. I mean, I've been in prison not as long as him. Uh, but the last thing on my mind in my first year of freedom is going to be to get involved, especially while you're still on the supervised release. I really pretty much canceled him out in my own head. And you're referencing uh, you're referencing Gene Gotti, who was uh, yes. John Gotti's yes. brother, who had yes. just recently come out of prison. And when uh, the news broke of, of Callie's murder, there was a lot of people uh, speculating that, that possibly this was a power grab on, on the right. Gotti family's part. Yeah, and, and the newspapers loved that, I, as you know. So they were probably uh, hoping it was him and there would be a war. Uh, but like I said, I didn't really jump to that conclusion. Uh, I don't rule out that there's a little more to it uh, because everybody starts writing that you need crash cars and this and that. Things have changed. I mean, uh, you know, we did a lot of work without crash cars, and uh, I wouldn't make that the uh, deciding factor in ruling out the mob because it wasn't a crash car. It's still, you know, one of my first ones that I ever did, and I uh, I put it in the book, or that I was involved in, I had to ice pick somebody's tire. And the next day's paper said, man killed fixing flat tire. So this was similar, where they banged into his car to get him out. Now, I'm not closing the door on that being a possibility, that it still was a setup. Explain to the audience uh, what a crash car is and how that would play a role in, in a mob hit and why that's kind of a well, uh, typical M.O. A crash car traditionally in the old days was always on, on the scene. If uh, you had a target somewhere and uh, you were going to pull up in one car, the shooter gets out. When he gets back in the, in the car to drive away, in case there's a cop, a police car, or anybody that wants to give chase, the crash car, which I did a few times, has, and I didn't have to crash into anybody, is expected to crash into uh, a pursuing cop or 
you know, whatever, anybody, even a bystander. So it was a safety factor. But as years long, that's been pretty much, uh, you know, it, it, it's not always there. I guess as we did plenty without, remember that guy with the uh, Spamoni guard and the LMB Spamoni guard, and that guy killed. The guy just came out of the shadows, shot him, and took off. And the other thing is, the less people involved, the less mounts to talk about it. So a lot of guys are doing work on their own now. So, uh, Larry, you grew up in Brooklyn. Um, I did. Yes, kinda... I grew up in Brooklyn. Talk about your childhood and, and, and the, the neighborhood that you grew up in in Brooklyn and, and how uh, the mob kind of maybe played a role in all the, in all the old school neighborhoods uh, of the boroughs. Well, the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, it's called Gravesend. It's uh, between Sheepset Bay and Bensonhurst. It's one of the, uh, you know, the uh, more popular Brooklyn neighborhoods. It was very, you know, it was a, a, a very tight-knit community, uh, a lot of different ethnic backgrounds, uh, but basically where I was was mostly Italian. And I grew up in a normal family, went to school. I uh, went through high school. I did about a year in college. I was always working. My dad was a fire lieutenant. Uh, my mom worked on and off, just, you know, banks and stuff as, you know, we got older. But there was always a mob presence. Uh, there was social clubs all around. Uh, as I grew up, I started noticing, you know, the, the fancy cars and different things like that, that you always read about. Uh, and it was really prevalent in the neighborhood. You, 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 you know, you couldn't walk too many blocks without a social club or a cafe uh, with a mob presence. Can you tell us about your first exposure to an actual made guy and uh, how that, that process of you uh, thinking about joining that, that life? Well, my Uncle Albert was a member of the Colombo crime family for many, many years. So I had an uncle that was right there. Uh, but he always kept us, um, his son and myself and my brother, kept us away from it. Uh, wasn't So I really never met a, a, a made guy until I met Greg Scarpa in, in the craziest way possible. Yeah, you, you, uh, you just for the uh, audience to kind of get a better understanding of, of your background and who you are. So you had a pretty unique entry point into the, into the life, a uh, little bit tawdry, um, kind of maybe talk about that situation and how you met Greg Scarpa through his, actually through his wife. Right. Well, well, like I said, I had a, a perfectly normal childhood. I had everything I could ask for from my parents. So there was, I wasn't looking to join the mob. Uh, at one of my jobs, I met an old woman that was very attractive and literally seduced me. I mean, I was only, I wasn't even 18 when we met. She was probably about 32, 33. Uh, and as the affair got more and more heated and tighter, she decided it would be a good idea for me to meet her husband. And lo and behold, the husband winds up being Craig Scarpa, the Grim Reaper, who is a heavyweight uh, street boss uh, in the Colombo family. So that was my entry into the life. This was the late, se- I, late 70s? Uh, yes, around 78, 78, 79. So without, without that meeting without me having that job and delivering groceries to her house, uh, I certainly would have been a fireman like my father or uh, maybe more, maybe a fire chief. Unfortunately, I went in a different direction. Kind of describe uh, Greg Scarpa. Like, what was he like as a gangster and what was he like as a man? I hate to use the word, but he was likable. People liked him because he had a, a, you know, a very charming way of speaking to people and always had a good sense of humor. He was likable. But as you got to know him, you saw the the greedy part, uh, the treacherous part of him. Uh, but he was a feared, uh, ice-cold killer. And probably the most murderous gangster, uh, you know, right up there with Al Capone. I mean, uh, you, you, there's not too many words to describe uh, his vicious side. He, he, he seemed, I mean, from reading about him and studying him, he, he seemed to kind of get some uh, type of titillation from violence. Like it, it was, uh, uh, he like he fed off of the the kind of the energy that came from being a murderer. Yeah, you know what you could uh, liken that to, and I said it to my partner Jimmy a few times when we would get the you know butterf- butterflies in our stomach. It was like. Before a game, a big game when you were playing football in high school, 
your adrenaline started going. That's how he got. He got very uh, excited about doing work. He wanted to make sure uh, everybody knew it was him, which was always peculiar. But later on, we found out why. It didn't matter to him that they knew. But he was very, uh, he once said he, he loved the smell of gun, gun smoke or gunfire, gunpowder. You know, so uh, he was definitely, definitely uh, the team captain. He loved what he was doing. He could bottle that uh, that scent. He'd uh, he'd market it as a as a cologne. Greg's <laughs> Greg's scarf is special. Or, that's funny. That's, make, you know, something maybe we should do. Uh, <laughs> make you smell and, like you know, gunpowder. No, he he would spray it in the car. You know how he hanged those little Christmas yeah. trees and things like that. He would hang that. He also loved the smell of money and getting the ink on his fingers. So he was very flamboyant about that stuff. Uh, not in the John Gotti way, but amongst us, very you know would puff his chest out about things like that. He would show me the ink on his hands when he was counting money. Uh, one time he, I asked him, how much money did you have? I was When I got really close to him, he told me if I pile my money up in one column to the sky, you'd climb to the top and jump, you'd die. So <laughs> that's a lot of money to pile up. So, so as Greg takes you under his uh, wing, so to speak, and, and you have an uncle who's part of the Colombo family. And, and as you're beginning this process of, of, of joining the organization yourself, do you think about, as, as someone who's going to be a, a made member, uh, do you think about the history of the family in its totality? Because some of the, some of the most important uh, mafia figures in the history of New York organized crime come out of the Colombo family. Uh, Joey Gallo, Joe Colombo, Joe Profaci, uh, Carmine uh, uh, Sir, um mm-hmm. I mean, do you do you think about uh, Carmine Persico? Does that matter to to a guy like you, or is that just for us criminologists? Aren't as a criminologist, I'm I'm impressed with that <laughs> pedigree, that lineage, <laughs> right? That right. lineage. But do you think about that as a guy who's actually going to live the life? Well, you know, all of the families had prominent type of names. There's always somebody that rises to the top, and all the guys you mentioned had their time in the limelight. Uh, most it doesn't last long, unfortunately, and I learned that too late. But growing up, uh, these guys were folklore almost. They were legends. So, uh, you know, I never thought I would be like them in any way. Uh, I really, the first one to uh, propose me was Linda. Linda wanted me to be a good fella. Uh, and then she convinced Greg that I would be good and he took me in closer and closer, and that's when I would start hearing about, you know, these guys like, uh, you know, Scappy and, and Junior and, uh, you know, Greg himself. I would learn more about him. Uh, Joe Gallo, I heard plenty of stories from Greg about, uh, you know, because they went through uh, wars on opposite sides. He stayed with Profaci in Persico back in the day and when they were fighting Gallo, the Gallo brothers. So... They were like uh, the history of our family. Uh, but we, it seems like the Columbos were always at war. They were the smallest family number-wise. Uh, didn't mean they weren't respected as much, if not more, than all the other families at, at, at times, uh, especially through the 70s. But those guys were like legends. Uh, and like As you know, Junior just passed away, and there's still uh, turmoil around that. They're saying they killed him in there. They didn't give him help. Just to give the the listeners some context, uh, so the Colombo family, um, in addition to being one of the smaller families and being one of the families that's produced uh, some of the most colorful characters in the mob, it's also been one of the most um, destabilized uh, mob borgatas uh, in New York City. Over the last uh, 50, 60 years, there's been three mob wars. Larry was involved in in the most recent one, which was in the 1990s. But there was a, a mob war in the early 60s, and then there was a mob war in the uh, early to mid-70s. The longtime boss of the Colombo family was a guy named Carmine Persico. Uh, his friends called him Junior. His enemies called him the Snake. And uh, Persico was the longest reigning uh, New York Mafia Don uh, as of uh, about two weeks ago when he passed away in prison. He'd been running the family from behind bars uh, since the 1980s. Larry, kind of talk about the state of the Colombo clan um, when you started to, uh, to, to, to be on the fringes of the group and then kind of work your way uh, deeper into the inner circles of, of the Scarpa crew. So that would have been the early 80s. Um, kind of just, very, just, yeah, very late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, discuss the state of the family. 
yeah, getting uh, uh, you know getting closer to Greg and closer to that you know to, to the Colombo family, uh, he would be he would take me around to lots of different places, different meetings. Uh, there was a time you know when it, Junior was only on the street, Junior Persico, for about two years, if that long, in my whole tenure. Uh, but one time I had to take him to, to Junior's club. I didn't go in; I stayed outside when he went in to talk to him. And I remember when he came out. And he started talking and saying some things. One of the comments he made to me was, they don't call him the snake for nothing. So <laughs> even his friends called him the snake. It's funny, but not to his face. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And the family was very, we were very tight and powerful. But with that, I learned the Colombo family kills their own a lot more and quicker than most of the other families. Uh and I think that's why there was always tension. There was always bodies turning up, bodies disappearing, uh, and, and always, you know, and that's pretty much how he held it so long. I think he kept uh, the Machiavelli thing going, you know, kept all divide and conquer, because there was, you know, uh, like you said, since the 50s, there's always been troubles. Even Joe Colombo, we forget that when he got shot. You know, uh, it wasn't a war, but... You know, somebody uh, had, had an axe to grind, obviously, and they say it was Joe Gallo. Greg always told me it was the government because after Joe Colombo was shot, Chubby, one of uh, who was who was uh, Joe Colombo's bodyguard, then killed the, right. the shooter. He shot him right on the spot. And right. he, he was practically escorted away. And Greg saw this happening. He said, "He, this guy was rushed out of there." You know, they were cops all around. They could have grabbed him. They let him go. And a few days later, he got uh, straightened out, Chubby, as a reward for that heroic act. Because uh, he wasn't a good fellow, even though he was his bodyguard at the time. I believe so, it was Chubby Edward, Rosillo was the name of the guy we're talking about. Chubby, uh, I, you know, I don't know his last name. Yeah, that was his last Chubby. name. Yeah. So, yep, I could use your help. You know, uh, sure. Did Greg ever but, comment on uh, his feelings about uh, Joe Colombo? attracting headlines and, and being this it Italian civil rights activist? Because we know that some of the other families, especially the Gambinos, did yeah. not like, did not and approve And just to give that. a little more context, Joe Colombo was the godfather of the Colombo crime family that took his name uh, from the early to mid-60s until he was, for all intents and purposes, assassinated at a uh, Italian Pride Day rally in, in New York City in 1971 or 71. two. Yeah. I was at Columbus Circle uh, in Manhattan, uh, and what happened, that was the really the pinnacle of his uh, Italian-American club uh, or, or movement. Or yeah, he became, an a he became an activist. Yes, because his son had problems with the FBI, so he thought this was the way to fight them, to say it was all, uh, you know, uh, made-up stuff, and they're just... Uh, they're being prejudiced Italian. against Italians. Yeah, prejudice, Exactly. And what happened, at the beginning, he had a lot of wise guys rallying around him, including Greg. But as it became bigger and bigger, he was asked to put somebody else up front, maybe an actor or uh, anybody but him. Uh, and he refused. Then they... Was he, he was going on talk shows, too. Like He was like going yeah, on television talking was, about this stuff. Yeah, he, exactly. He was, too, he was too much in the limelight, and he was a known mob boss. So everybody knew the name. I mean, when I say everybody, I mean anybody who needs to know knows who he is doing that. And then he was uh, requested in a strong way to stop, and he still didn't. He was adamant. He was the boss, and he was going to do what he wanted. So ultimately... Uh, he got killed and all the, uh, you know, all the conspiracy theories. But Greg told me it was the government. That was his exact words to me. So uh, Junior Persico took over for Joe Colombo. He was in and out of prison quite a bit at that time right. and really was only on the street for a handful of years in the 70s and, and early 80s. Mm -hmm. Then eventually... Uh, got brought down in what was known as the commission case, where they brought down uh, the five leaders of the uh, of the five families in New York City. So now the Colombo family at that point started to fracture, and you had people that were loyal to Persico, who was going to 
uh, have to serve the rest of his life behind bars, but was insistent on leading the family and and using uh, blood family members and loyalists as as buffers and fronts. And then you had a group, an offshoot group that eventually became an insurgents led by uh, a capo named uh, Little Vic Arena that opposed uh, the Persico, the Persico's reign from behind bars and kind of talk about the, the, the foundation that was laid for this unrest that eventually, um, you know, bubbled over in the nineties. But I'm guessing in, in the late eighties, you could see some of the moving parts setting up to what eventually right. happened in the nineties. Well, it, it, in the, uh, middle eighties around 86, 87, uh, uh, Vicarina was, uh, put in the, acting boss position by Junior Persico because he was going to be gone for, uh, for, you know, life. He put him there, and I remember Greg telling me at one point that he didn't put a strong enough guy there. Vic wasn't uh, a, a real street thug or a tough guy in, in, the, in the way of a guy like Greg or Junior. So ultimately, he was able to have his strings pulled. There's a lot more to how the war started. First of all, first of all, Junior is a boss until he decides to step down or gets voted out unanimously. That possibility is minute because uh, once you become a boss, you put your closest friends, family, sons, brothers in important positions. So they're not all going to turn against you. So that's not likely to happen. But Vic being asked by other prominent members of the family and other families like John Gotti, who was a catalyst, wanted Vic to be the official boss for their own selfish reasons. So he's told, just have all your captains vote him out. He asks his consulier, at the time it was Jimmy Angelina, to approach all the captains, which he does. And I was there directly next to Greg when he was talking to Jimmy Angelina, and Jimmy asked him, uh, meaning Greg, where he would stand if Vic wants all the capos to vote him out. Greg just got back from being very, very sick. As we all know, he, he wound up with the AIDS virus and all kinds of things, uh, health issues. So he told Jimmy that he is semi-retired until his health gets better and wherever the chips fall, he'll fall. Once we got back in the car, I asked Greg, why didn't you tell him, pick a side? Why didn't you declare yourself? I was surprised, knowing Greg all these years, that he didn't declare himself. He explained to me he didn't know who Jimmy was speaking for. If he was speaking for Junior, Vic will have him killed. Uh, Junior would have him killed if he goes on Vic's side, and vice versa. If he says, okay, I'm staying with Junior, Vic is going to tell Jimmy Greg's got to go. So he was in a very precarious situation. And, and Jimmy Angelino ends up being killed uh, well, that, allegedly by Vic Arena. That's my next point. Uh, Jimmy Angelino now disappears. Okay, nobody knows where he is for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, of course, we find out he's gone. Now, he brings Carmine Sessa, who he knows is close to Greg, the guy that you need to have on your side in the family, and makes him the consulier. He asks Carmine to do the same thing. Go to the Capos, go to Greg. As soon as Carmine came to Greg, Greg busted out laughing. He said, he's going to do the same thing to you. So now Carmine gets paranoid, obsessive, and he feels... He's going to be killed, so he goes after Vic first. Well, doesn't he and also? That, doesn't didn't Carmine Sessa then at that point go to the Persicos and tell them what was going on? Um, I don't know for sure. I mean, he was talking to Teddy Persico and Senior, Teddy Persico Senior, and Teddy Persico Senior was a very simple-minded guy. So a lot of times messages didn't get sent around the right way. So he very well might have said something to Teddy, but by the time Teddy brought it to Junior, it could have come out differently. So I'm not going to go into that because I don't have first-hand knowledge of it. But I was there when he came to ask Greg for help, and Greg just thought it was hysterical that he was going to do this all over again. Uh, so, again, that's really what started the war. I, I, I now went after uh, Vic. 
I, I don't know if the you know some of the listeners that that we have aren't always going to be mob aficionados or whatnot, but I think it's important to note that you know there there are a ton of politics involved in running a crime family, oh. um, and it, and it's not just uh, you know guys getting together and playing cards and. And uh, you know, uh, robbing, uh, hijacking trucks, and 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 dealing drugs. There's a lot of um, diplomacy that's involved in it, and a lot of uh, buffering and placating. And and w- when it doesn't go right, you you have the situation that that you had, um, you know, in the Columbos, and you have a, a an all out street war erupt in New York City for up to 2 years that you were you know you were smack dab in the middle of kind of talk about when things really started to pop off uh I know that um Greg himself and I believe his his daughter and granddaughter survived an assassination attempt mm-hmm. which then kind of ramped up the violence that that had already started to 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 get going yeah once uh Carmine made his move uh on Vic uh they they became now went from a cold war, you know, of uh, two sides sort of forming to a shooting war. And ultimately Greg was the first uh target, but it was a botched attempt. And even though Greg insisted at that point that we come back and make a move, Carmine was still trying to use diplomacy. And you just touched on that. There is an administration with all the families, so there, each and every family has a representative that would tr- uh, be on the peace committee to try to keep us from going to war. But uh, as time went by, our own side just kept cracking, so there was no true administration anymore. We had two separate families within the family, uh, and that's why you know Vic had to make a move now. So he went after Greg. Once he failed, we wanted to come back, but were told only a top guy. We can only go after Vic, uh, other guys like Aloy, uh, Joe Scopo, who was the underboss, Nikki Black. Then another one of our guys gets killed. Hank. Hank the Hank Bank the Smurra. Bank. So Hank the yep. Bank Smurra, just again for, for listeners, um, the first casualty in the uh, what was known as the Colombo Mob War of the 90s was Henry Hank the Bank Smurra, um, who I believe was killed in front of a Dunkin' Donuts in Brooklyn. Um, uh, in Sheepshead Bay, yes, he was killed. Uh, and that was in ni- that was in late ninety one, I believe. Um, no, it okay. would have been that late because I I, I think. Well, don't hold me to that because I got I yeah, I got it. November in, prison November. in ninety, the end of ninety one. So I would say in the maybe ninety, but you you probably have no. I got, I'm looking thing. at it. It says November twenty fourth, ninety one. It was ninety one, huh? Okay, so then I must have went in in ninety two. Pretty or something. Uh, anyway, uh, well, if you got it, there, that, that's right. My time frame is a little off. It's been a while back, and sometimes you try to put it out of your head as hard as it is. But yeah, Hank was—he was with another guy. I think it was Louis Black, the guy on our side, <clears throat> that they were going to try to get an apartment in Sheepshead Bay. You know, like going to the mattresses at different places around the city. Louis was ran over to a payphone to call the realtor to let him know he was there. And that's when Hank uh, got killed. And it, it, I guess it came out somewhere along the way. And I hate to say it like that. I wasn't there to, to see it. But they say that it was Chicky uh, DiMartino, who's doing a life sentence now, and who was on Wild Bill's side, who was on Vic's side, and he was a heavyweight. Uh, it does get confusing with all the names. I understand that. But Hank was the one that would fall asleep anywhere. And that sleep apnea disease or whatever it is, and he fell asleep. It's narcolepsy. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, if that's the word. Uh, and so he was an easy target. But I was going to say, just to give further context, so the war breaks out, Carmine Persico goes in prison, and and Greg Scarpa kind of becomes his uh, his muscle on the street leading the war. On the other side, uh, Larry just referenced Wild Bill. Uh, you had a guy named uh, uh, William Wild Bill Cotolo who became Arena's uh, main muscle on the street. So they were uh, uh, kind of counterparts in that regard where uh, Greg Scarpa was, was the muscle for, for Persico and, and Wild Bill was the muscle for, for Arena. Would that be accurate? Very accurate. And it was a, there was a comment made by Wild Bill once to Vic Arena, let me take care of Brooklyn, meaning Greg. So Meaning let know, me kill him. Yes. Right. Yes. Because he wanted a, 
uh, he was a very prominent in Brooklyn, uh, and Greg was the other real prominent guy in Brooklyn because on 11th Avenue, the press goes all gone. So there wasn't that same prominence. Uh, and downtown, you had the Russos, so they were still, uh, uh, you know, a, a heavyweight team there. And the Russos were cousins of, of Carmine Persico, right? Yes, and that goes to what I said before. They all were made captains uh, at very young ages because they were blood relatives, and they're not going to turn on their uncle, uh, you know, or Andrew Russo's son isn't going to turn on the Persicos, obviously. Yeah, and and Car- so, Carmine's cousin, the the kind of the, 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 the patriarch of the Russo clan, uh, Andrew Andy Mush Russo, who's been right. one of Carmine's uh, acting bosses, is best friends with James Kahn, Sonny Corleone himself. Yes. Yep, he came into a bunch of trials, yep. which is a, another funny anecdote, but maybe for another time. So now, uh, after Hank gets killed... Carmine literally comes to the house crying. I mean, he was pretty tight with Hank. And uh, we insist that it's open season. Basically, Greg. But at that point, I agreed. And I was tired of being hunted and knowing that these guys were looking for us. So I was 100% behind Greg uh, when he said it's open season. I was looking forward to protecting myself and letting them know I'm not going to be an easy target. So uh, then we just went out every single day driving around the whole city looking at various uh, social clubs. You were stalking your prey. Yes. We, you know, we knew the social clubs on Avenue. We knew this, you know, the cafe on M where Joe Scopo was. We went to Wild Bill's club several times. Uh, he wasn't, you know, there anymore knowing that there was going to be retaliations. Uh, obviously, Vic Arena was deep in hiding. Joe Waverly popped up a few times at his clubs. We had some shootout with him. Uh, with him. Uh, and ultimately, the last shootout, we hit him pretty good, although he lived. He was very lucky. There was a, uh, an ambulance on coffee break right around the block. So when he got shot, he was getting a transfusion within minutes. And they kept him alive. You, and, uh, you guys also uh, uh, ended up uh, taking out a guy that was uh, hanging Christmas lights, right? Vinny Venus? Yes, that was uh, after w- the first attempt we uh, ha- had was on uh, Funzi D'Ambrosio. Uh, he's a longtime made guy in the family who, for some, well, he had his reasons. Uh, they all had their reasons, usually money or a vendetta of some kind. His brother had gotten killed years ago, and I guess uh, he had that vendetta against Persico. Uh, his brother was Sally D, a real, real tough guy from the old days who one of my Uncle Albie's best friends. So we targeted that club, and we shot at Ponzi, but we wound up hitting Joe T., who's Mickey Black's nephew, and Tommy Amato, who was with the Genovese family. So that could have caused a lot of problems, but it didn't, uh, because he should have been there. Uh, his own boss, the Chin, told him that, don't be hanging out in these clubs. He told all his men that. So... Greg told Carmine the same thing. He said he should have been there. We did nothing wrong. And ultimately, there was no problem with the other family. Uh, But that was just a a weak answer, but at least they knew we were shooting. About a week later, uh, we see Vinny Venus, who is uh, Wild Bill's first cousin. Vincent Fusaro, who went by the nickname Vinny Venus, just for the listeners. Yes, yes. And uh, he drove by my pool room. After uh, the attempt on Greg, and some of my guys were in front of the, uh, the, the you know the pool room waiting for us to come, and he flashes us the middle finger because he was on the scene. We found out later he was one of the crash cars. So after the shooting, he thought it was successful. He drove off. Well, he was just one of the extra cars around for whatever. Uh, there was a big plan they had. They had a truck to block him in. They had a van you know, to, to pull up behind them. And that's where you had mentioned uh, the daughter was. They all left the house together that day. And these guys really should have called it off. But they shot with the, with the girl in between uh, with a baby in the car. So that wasn't a, a good thing. And uh, anyway, we come, we were driving around these different areas looking. And Jimmy takes, who's my partner, takes a right to go a different direction to get back to the pool room because he, he avoids the lights. And it takes us past 
where we see Vinnie Venus's big black Lincoln, and he's hanging his Christmas lights. So we had a, a car behind us the whole way, but the car that was behind us went up straight on to the pool room. We came back around the block, and uh, Greg just put the rifle out the window. Uh, I thought we were all going to get out. He says, no, 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 I'll do it right from here. He opens the window, puts the rifle out, and he hits him uh, one time right you know, behind the ear. The shot was incredible. Guy went right down. Uh, Jimmy was about to drive away. He was told to stop, and Greg put two more on him from, you know, uh, maybe 20 feet away with a rifle. And that was now uh, sent pretty much uh, a strong message back to them. So now it became who can get who. We just kept driving around. We heard about another guy of ours, Black Sam, getting killed. He was a dinosaur in the family. He was probably 85 or 86. Uh, the they last they time killed him in a social him. club, I think. Yes, they went in a social club. Got him. Again, Chicky's name came up. I don't know for sure it was him, but somebody said they saw him. The last time Greg and I saw uh, Black Sam, we would go in a lot. Uh, Greg was tight with him because they both got made the same day back in the 60s, whatever it was, 50s, I don't even know. Uh, but he was that old, uh, Black Sam. And we told him he should be staying in his club. Why don't you, you know, keep the place closed for a while? He reaches into his drawer. I'll never forget it. He can hardly pick up the gun. He says, let him come in here. You know, he was trying to impress us that he was ready and he's, he's not going to run from anybody. Soon after, he got killed. Uh, it wasn't quick then, enough on the draw. No, no, I don't even think he, he had any chance. You know, it becomes storming in. And and they, unfortunately, they hit his girlfriend, too. She didn't die, but uh, it became a pattern for, for their side, getting innocent people hurt. And the kid in the bagel store was an infamous thing that happened uh, and disgusting. They killed an, a kid that had nothing to do with the war. Uh, they shot at a, one of our guys, Fat Larry, uh, in the middle of a busy street where people were getting sprayed and some got run over, you know, in the mayhem afterwards. So it, it got sloppy. And that's, I guess, when, you know, the feds really got involved and the task force. But there was, like, killings back and forth and attempts back and forth. And then ultimately, you know, the, the Nicky Black thing, uh, he had sent a message and he was now Vic's consulier because Carmine was, you know, on the other side. Uh, we went uh, to the other families with our administration and said, this is the family. They were still trying to do it, so he made uh, Nikki Black his consul, yeah. And that's Nikki Black Grancio. Uh, yes. And, and he was murdered in a, uh, a pretty brazen fashion, and yes. it's probably the most controversial gangland slain of the war because it's alleged that Greg Scarpa's relationship with the FBI, which we'll get into in a second— um, tipped him off to uh, where, where Grancio was, was. Well, a few days earlier, uh, maybe a couple of days earlier, Nikki Black sends a message to my oh, Uncle Albert yes, that I should come over to their side or he's going to kill me. He thought if I came over and Jimmy came over and a few of Greg's crew came over, it would be easier, it would weaken Greg. And he was right. I mean, Greg was, you know, old and, you know, pretty frail at this time without us guys around him, he would have been, you know, uh, what he once was. So we made him on the born target after that. And we were lucky in quotes that he showed up that day that we were doing our own little surveillance. Uh, and we started using that word because we were, uh, we had a little fake siren in the window. We had, you know, coffee cups in the window. We, we had baseball hats on. We wanted to look like that's what we were, you know, police doing surveillance. And uh, we had a scanner and we had a shoe phone. One of those old big, I call it a shoe phone to this day. You know what I'm talking about, but it's like the stockbrokers used to use right. in the 80s. <laughs> the, Zach Morris, the Zach Morris phone for, right. the, for the youngins. Yeah. Right. So, and he was on that constantly. So, you know, he, he had... He was getting information. At the time, we thought it was somebody on the other side. Later on, as you just said, we'll talk about it. Uh, the truth came out. We did get several phone calls. We had the, the scanner, so we knew where they were at all times. Uh, but he, he did. He pulled up, and we stalked him. To use that word again, followed him around. As he drove off, he pulled over to 
get an envelope from, I guess, one of his uh, guys on, under him. And uh, as he did, we pulled up right alongside of him. And he, to this day, I, 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 I believe he thought we were cops pulling up because we would never let any car pull up near us. We left space between us at red lights. Jimmy had the left mirror. Greg had the right mirror. I was always looking around. Nobody was going to sneak up on us. So I don't know how this guy didn't turn. I literally had my whole body out the window, got within an inch of him, and he never turned. He was probably telling his nephew or something, the law is pulling up. You know, it was like sort of stiff. And uh, and we blasted him. Uh and it was. It's, that was a, a sent shockwaves around the family that somebody that high up in, on Vic's side was able to get. So if I can jump in here, one of the more controversial elements of this story is the fact that Scarpa, ironically, was an FBI informant. And, and he's receiving intel from specifically, I believe it's Lynn DeVecchio was the FBI uh, case agent there. Right. And um, yes. would you say that... Uh, DeVecchio was also protecting or shielding Greg Scarpa from prosecution from other government agencies or agents? Absolutely. And one thing I saw from a forensic person, uh, a girl, showed me official documents that Jimmy and I were listed as the street informants to protect Greg's status. Wow. So... Yeah, and I saw the paperwork, okay? They were going that far to protect him that they jeopardized us. We could have gotten If that would have leaked out, I mean, our own side would have had to kill us. Right. It's It seems remarkable to me that that story has not generated the same type of publicity that the Whitey Bulger Boston FBI scandal it, did. Well, uh, it kills me. And there's so many things like the uh, that I, I I don't understand how they were swept under the carpet when I told them we had the secret frequency that only the task force and the FBI had, but we had it. So we were listening to them follow us. We were listening to them follow our enemies. We knew when where where all where they were at all times and who they were following. So that was helping us find our enemies. So I gave them that information. Nobody, either side, the defendants or the government, really pursued that. I gave them the records of the, the, the big phone that we had. And if you remember, back in those days, every phone call was itemized. So they're asking me, was he calling the Vecchio? Well, you know who he called. I gave them that list. They can find out very easily who Greg was calling or who was calling him. Neither side ever demanded that information. Whatever happened to that phone list? So they went above and beyond to protect this guy. Uh, and the funny thing is, you know, the, the, the prosecutor out there now, Weissman, is under intense scrutiny right now. He was like one of the, uh, the spearheads of this whole thing. Now, during this whole war, uh Greg Scarp is also dying of AIDS, which is another yes. kind of uh, soap opera esque uh, strand of this entire story. Can you kind of just very quickly recap how he uh, encountered the virus and then how it played a role in kind of maybe him, you know, feeling like you know he was dying anyway. You might as well go out exactly. in a blaze of glory. And did you know that, or did was he well, always he always kept it under I, the guise of cancer? No, I knew he had it. He told me, sat me down one day and told me, he wanted me to be sure that I was safe and everything like that and uh, uh, it, how it had happened through the blood transfusion and obviously he has to abstain now and whatever, uh, although we were, you know, Linda and I were long time finished by then. Uh, but he still, I guess, out of courtesy or whatever you want to call it, he wanted to let me know. So, you no, know, I knew that he had that. And then little by little, his family members started knowing. Uh, and he got it. Uh, you know, after I, I said before his health ailments would happen, he used to pop aspirins like six a day without just eating them, without water, without a glass of milk, with <laughs> nothing, gross. just just eating them. <laughs> and they bur literally burnt holes in his stomach. So he had these bleeding ulcers. 
and he goes in for an operation, and it, uh, ultimately the doctor that does it just came off an operation, and he wasn't really prepared, and and they, they wound up with a lawsuit, but he left uh, arteries hanging and stuff, so it, it only got worse. He His whole stomach was full with blood, and they had to have like 10 emergency operations to save him, so he needed blood. All the men came in, and women that were close to him, we all came to give blood. He insisted it had to be from us because he he was comfortable with that uh he wasn't comfortable with the hospital's blood and they tried to tell him we screen it and all of this he insisted one of our guys paulie paul melly is a weightlifter and he used to use uh a needle for testosterone obviously it comes out that he shared that needle with others and winds up with the hiv with the aids his blood is the one that matches. So you can go a lot of different directions with that. Was it divine intervention? Was it, uh, you know, what you got coming for being the way you were? But the one person was Paul, and he gets that blood. So, yeah, during the war, he was getting worse and worse, both mentally and physically. He was losing when weight, too. You know, by the end of the war, he yeah. was down to like 100 pounds. Right. And this was a guy that at one point was a, a, a strapping 220, 220, 220, yeah. 230, but solid. Not a fat, two, I mean, a solid, solid man. Uh, but yeah, he became very, very uh, frail and skinny. But then it started getting to his head, too, where he uh, had the dementia setting in. So his decisions weren't good. And I used to get in arguments with him, Linda, uh, other members now, uh, as I was able to talk to everybody at this point. Uh, that it was getting, you know, he was getting dangerous and, and careless. Like, like you said, he, I believe at this point, he was figured he's going soon. You know, he'd almost rather go out in a blaze of glory and be remembered that way. Uh, but, you know, he was failing to consider Jimmy and I with young wives and young families and young children, you know, and their futures. So, uh, it got uh, it got very frustrating. You know, we thought at times, Jimmy and I, of almost, you know, looking at each other and saying, should we do it? Should we take this guy out, just end it? Wow. You know, we were the ones that could do it. That's how bad it got. You know, but, you know, the, the, the bottom line, we'd never be trusted by anybody, and it wouldn't have been a, a loyal act, obviously. But we did get to that point where we looked at each other several times with the look that, you know, and it, it's very, 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 very edgy. So, Larry, if I can jump in here, we're almost out of time. And um, uh, one thing that I, I found online and I'm, I'm very impressed with is a picture of you and Robert De Niro. So I'm, I'm wondering if we could finish up here with you telling us a little bit more about what you're up to lately and future projects and um, yes. just what's going on now, please. And then we'll promote your book as well. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, I did write the book. It's called The Life. Uh, and, it, you know, some of the police officers that uh, were first on the scene and that of some of the hits and one or two of them I, I grew up with uh, are now Robert De Niro's uh, security. <laughs> so when he, uh, when they made the deal to do this movie called The Irishman that's coming out, as most of us know, uh, in October now. He asked them if they can reach someone who was or is in the life and would really talk to him about how things really happen, meaning hits and disposal of weapons and a, and a, a variety of, of information he needed. So they all said me. So a few, couple of months later, uh, I go meet with him. And it was supposed to be an hour. He kept me there from 12 to 3, just wow. listening to me. A few, times, <laughs> a few times I had to say, Mr. De Niro, I said, am I talking too much? No, 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 no please. Keep a little going. bit. She did a little bit. A little <laughs> bit she yeah, did. Well, wait a minute. That's funny you just said that. I'll tell you. So now uh, he wants me to be, he, he calls me back a few weeks later. He asks some more questions. And then he asks if I would go, if I would like to meet Marty Scorsese. So I say, of course, I mean, it's been an honor meeting you. Imagine, you know, being meeting both of you, that would be wonderful. The next day I'm at Marty's house, and he has his casting directors there. And ultimately they give me a screening. They had one part in mind for me, which would have been 
an incredible part. I would have been sitting with him and Pacino and Joe Pesci several times through the movie with a lot of, with a lot of lines. But there were various things uh, that didn't make that possible. So I wind up being in the movie anyway. I, uh, I'm the hitman that kills Albert Anastasia in the barber seat. So when you watch the movie, watch for me. <laughs> that's me doing that. Yeah, it's the Irishman. And, uh, it's the Marty Scorsese's new like oh, two hundred million dollar Netflix I think uh, about movie. Two hundred. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. it's going to be about uh, we got a very Detroit uh, uh, yes. edge to that film with the it's the story of the relationship between Frank the Irishman Sheeran, who was a, a East Coast teamster slash hitman, and then Jimmy Hoffa, who was the most. Uh, iconic yeah. labor leader probably in American history and whose murder is still unsolved here uh, almost yes. uh, 50 years later. So, yeah, yep, and it's, a great, it's really a great story, and some of it rings true, some of it still leaves questions, uh, but there's a few things that I'm looking for in the movie to see if uh, Mr. De Niro uh, took my advice. I think he will. Uh, i got to tell you a funny anecdote. There was one thing I told him. He had asked me about going into a place, would you ever use two guns? And I says, it's hard enough shooting one and aim them one. I said, it's not like the Wild West where you run in and just start clipping right. people. I said, I, I, I might have a second gun on me. And I said, the other thing, I said, there's no way I'm going to walk into a place. And it's a, specifically, the one I'm talking about is a Joe Gallo hit that this guy claims to have done. And have my driver take a ride around the block. I'm going to tell him, you sit right here till I come back out. Because, you know, you drive around the block in New York can get stuck behind sanitation, red lights, double parked cars. I said, you're going to shoot this guy, come out, and nobody's going to be there. So there was a funny picture. When he's filming this scene, he goes in, he does it. The guy drives off to go around the block. De Niro comes back out, and there's no car. He's got two <laughs> guns in his hand, and he's got his arms wide open. So hopefully uh, that rang true to him, That what I told him, uh, among other things. I got into a, a show called The Perfect Murder. I played, this is also a funny coincidence, I play a corrupt ex-cop named uh, Joe Blasco out of Las Vegas who works for Tony Spilatro, who is Joe Pesci's character in Casino. And it's a true murder story about a guy named Ron Rudin who got killed in the 80s. And one of the suspects was the mob, Angle and Spilatro and, and myself. So that's what's called the perfect murder. Uh, and it's, the reason I bring that up is one of the lines I, you know, I was able to improvise. They wanted me to do that, be sarcastic. So I stole a few little ways. Uh, like one of them I had to say how the car was very, very dirty. Uh, and that's, if you remember, James Kahn. When he said he's taking this very, very personal. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, God, yeah. So I used that, right. and I told him that. I told him that I also said I had to smarten the guy up. I had, well, they didn't use that word. I was taking it for a ride. I got to convince you. I said, I'm, wise guy wouldn't say I'm going to convince you to do this. So I said, let me smarten you up a little bit. <laughs> and I told him I used that line, too. And he says, well, that's good. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, you take something that worked. So anyway, yeah. So hopefully I get, maybe I'll get a few more parts. Uh, uh, we're working on a high-end documentary right now. Uh, I can't name the company yet, but they're very prominent, uh, and they want to do a high-end, big-budget doc, several episodes, and hopefully that will impress the network into turning it into a Sopranos-like series. Awesome. So yeah, that sounds that's fantastic. not too far off. Uh, to, uh, I have to go back to New York in, in about a month to uh, complete my filming, and then we're going to... We have a lot of good people coming on there, some agents, some cops, uh, a judge, Jerry Capisi. Uh, I have to reach out to him. He says, if I, if I call him, he'll, you know, if he wants to talk to me, he'll do it. Uh, so uh, that's pretty exciting to him. Hoping that doesn't hit us, uh, you know, uh, any skids. And De Niro's still very interested. You know, the last I heard, you know, after I met Scorsese, he then sent me to Nick Pelleggi's house. And Pelleggi already had my book, and he had hundreds of notes made, so, you know, there's something in their thoughts, too. So uh, what one of you gentlemen said, it's surprising that it's never come out yet. It's going to start coming out. I think now is the time. Uh, I think enough of uh, the FBI agents are retired that might not have wanted it to happen or 
pressured people, whatever it may be the case. But it seems to be it's going to come out now. Well, this was great. Uh, Larry Meza, just uh, an outstanding storyteller. You can get his book, The Life, uh, on Amazon, uh, anywhere books are sold. You can uh, go to the theater or or stream uh, uh, Irishman uh, on Netflix in October. If I may, if I may, the best way is, and and all the books come signed with a a DVD with the song that was written for the book, as well as uh, a little trailer. At, at uh, www.larrymaza-thelife.com. Okay, great. Thank you, Larry. This was awesome. This was an incredibly compelling interview, and um, well, we really appreciate you joining us here on the OG. And you're always welcome back to come and, and tell you. stories. Uh, and, Scott, and I'll always be there for you. Uh, just let me know when it's on so I can listen in with you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Larry.